fight to prove I'm right. I don't need to be forgiven. Yeah, 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 yeah. My personal food foraging anthem has put me in the mood for the pursuit of perhaps my most tempting quarry to date. Hello? My guide uh, is to morning. be John Montgomery, morning. Morning. who gave up life as a Getting steel well. executive to spend his time chasing shellfish under the sea. Thanks. Stick this in here. We cruise through the clear blue waters to a little rocky island in a sheltered bay. The whole scene seemed more like Greece than Scotland. Very interesting little creatures. Their life cycle, their lifespan is quite amazing. You know, I mean, some of the bigger scallops that we get, 16, 17 years old, a shell that's six and a half, seven inches across, which is huge. And then on the other end, you can find scallops sometimes that are very, very small, maybe a quarter of an inch, just one up from the planktonic stage. And then when you're diving, you find them every stage in between. Up to about five years old, they will actually try and swim away from you. But the larger scallops basically are too big to propel themselves through the, through the water. They have found a place that suits them and they just stay there. There are only about 50 scallop divers in Scotland. You know, because it's not a career that you would choose. You know, it pays well if, you, if you're any good at it, but uh, two years was plenty. Plenty. I mean, in that short period of time, I think there were four or five divers died. The jinx on my fishing finally seems to have been lifted, and not before time. We bagged over two dozen scallops in a half-hour dive. Amazing. Oh, and successful. A little. A little, <laughs> by your standards, I'm sure. <laughs> by my standards, a bounty. Oh. I've seen on restaurant menus that they, they say dived scallops. That's the honourable way to get them, isn't it? The other way is to dredge the seabed. What do you think of that? I think it's dreadful. But a scallop diver picks the scallops, you know, he leaves the smalls, he doesn't disturb the seabed. A dredger scrapes the seabed and scrapes all the life from it, everything. And it ends up like a, a red blaze football pitch. Perfectly flat, lifeless, sterile seabed. And that's how most scallops are. are and that's just happening, what, acre and acre after acre all over Miles the Miles of seabed. Miles. If you want to sell them to the French, 
this is the kind of scallop that they're wow, after. Wow, that's a beauty. You see it's got depth as well as width, so you've got a lovely, lovely meat in there. Well, if it's all right with you, John, I might intercept the French on this one. Feel free. And open it up for me. Down the middle. Yeah, but still you can see it's a nice. Uh, it's a good size, isn't it? That is a very good size, isn't it? Twitching. Still twitching. Mm. I think that's verging on the barbaric. It's verging on the very tasty. Is it really? Mm -hmm. Give me a corner then. You have the Just a little side. piece, you know, I don't want to overdo it. Pretty more so. Very sweet. Mmm. Incredibly mm. fresh. Actually sweeter than when you cook it, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Best way, I think. Lovely. Yeah. I still think, don't think I'll eat them cooked. Scotland still has its fair share of smallholders subsisting off the land. Crofters on Mull depend mainly on the stock they raise. But they also maintain the tradition of boosting their resources by gathering the natural harvest of the seashore. Linda is a third generation crofter and she offered to take me in search of more top class shellfish. getting almost dead low tide now. It's, it? I would think it's almost at its lowest. In another 15, 20 minutes, it should be on the turn and coming back in again. Well, you've got a stout pair of waders. I have. But I'm a bit less well equipped. I think you're going to have to brave it, Hugh. Well, they'll be all right up here. They'll be absolutely fine. I don't want to find a, I get back and they've drifted off with the tide. No, they'll be absolutely fine. The tide is not quite in the turn yet, so uh -huh. you've got at least an hour before you have to panic. Hey, let's go guddling. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> guddling? Guddling is an old Scots word, generally applied when poaching salmon out of a river. Uh-huh. But, but you use it for... Mucking oh. 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 Dear me. Okay. You've got a hand. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, that looks sore in your back. There's very squelchy mud it here. It is, isn't it? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. I'll be all right. Like very sore. I'll be all right if you give me a guddle. <laughs> It started. Nice it's wonderfully clear water. It's beautiful clear water. Here's one. Ah, oh, well done. And a good size. One nil. One nil. <laughs> I'm afraid I get very competitive about this. Two nil. I think that's two one, you. It's well worth the wet sleeve. This Scottish marine harvest is the wild bounty I've long been dreaming of. Yes, I think that's a little bit We guddled on picking up wild native oysters from the knee-deep waters. By the time the rising tide forced a retreat, we had enough to open a champagne bar. And on the way back, we topped up our buckets with huge barnacle-clad mussels. The secret of this abundance? The cleanest seawater in Europe, and the crofters' sound policy of gathering only what they want for their own consumption and leaving the rest for tomorrow. Well, I thought we'd have the scallops naked, the oysters in their half shell, and the mussels completely in their shells. And just let them open slightly. Just wait for them to bubble yeah. open. At London prices, that's about 50 quid's worth of shellfish on my barbie. Well, these have just steamed open. I think they should be just ready. Do you have any preference, Hugh, for the shellfish in front of you, or like me, do you enjoy each one just as much? I just feel totally spoiled to have them all on one plate at the same one time. One time. I just think it's, it's brilliant. Beautiful. That looks absolutely wonderful. And it looks beautifully beautiful. Thank you. I think the scallops are in most urgent need of eating. I think I would agree with that. Aye, aye. I think I'll eat it all at once without mm. actually. Mmm. 
No pepper, no garlic, no oil, no nothing. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Well, uh, really good. Mm. Mm. Well, I'd rather enjoy my food and be messy than have to have to sit stiffly and eat it without enjoying it. Mm. Mm? Absolutely right. Which is why it's so much nicer out here. Mm. So I must say, I'm rather falling in love with this place. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful sport. I thought I might stay for a while. I think it would be lovely if you stayed for a while, Hugh. We'd love to have you. You're not by any chance single, are you? I am at the moment, yes. God, what an amazing <laughs> bit of luck. When I woke up the following morning, I had company. Very irritating company. Ugh! <sighs> And now it's over to Leslie for an updated midge count. According to local crofters and backed up by our own midgeometer, the midge count currently is a medium four, rising to midge force nine imminently. Under these conditions, we would advise campers to douse themselves liberally in midge repellent and hermetically seal themselves into their tents. Stay tuned for further updates. There's a new sound in the glen. It's small. Even with Force 9 midges imminent, I still have to find some breakfast. Well, what a delight to escape from those bloody midges. They don't seem to like it down here in the tidal zone, but these chaps like it all right. Cockles, yet more fine Scottish seafood. Though to be honest, I'm getting a little tired of the exclusive shellfish diet. And after a bit of this, I thought I'd nip up to the woods and see if I can get anything leafy or fungal to accompany my cockles. Aha! This is a larch, and these little mushrooms must be larch boletus. Yeah, you can tell it's a boletus because of the spongy bit underneath. It has spongy bit instead of gills. This one's not the absolute apex of the boletus family, but it's pretty tasty all the same. This little plant, that looks like a clover, is wood sorrel. Very sharp. In fact, the Elizabethans used to use it as a lemon substitute. And I think a squeeze of this on my mushrooms will go very nicely. Sautéed larch boletus and steamed cockles make up one of my finest breakfasts to date. Scotland is turning out to be a wild food nirvana. to run out around here, for a while at least, is heather. Scotland has over six million acres of it. It's not of much interest to the cook, but for the brewer it offers some interesting possibilities. And I'm going to investigate those possibilities now. 
a tough job. Someone's got to do it. My tutor in the art of beer making is aptly enough called Bruce. And he's not Australian either. So what have we got here? Malted barley, milled malt, which we're going to use to um, be the basis of our beer. It's like a flour mixed with husk, okay, as you can see, quite coarsely ground. So this is your basic starting point for any beer. This is the raw material, yep. This is the one that gives you the alcohol and gives you the texture. So we just make this into a nice porridge. Yep. Takes you back to your sand pit, this does, not it? Exactly, back to my sand pit. Pour the rest of that water on the top of this. And we'll put it on to warm up. As it warms up, all the starches that are in there will turn into sugars. We mustn't let it go above about 70 degrees C. And how do we know when it's done? Well, best to put the lard on the top. That's what the lard's for. That's what you bought this yeah. for. I wonder what that was doing. So I just really want to squeeze a bit of that out and throw it on the surface. It will tell us when the top of the malt has got to 60 degrees C because the lard will, will melt. What now? I suppose we ought to go and get some heather. Lovely. In the basket. <coughs> you got a knife? <coughs> we have a nice one. We have this. Prime specimen. Yes. For our modest five gallon we brew, we need one yeah, basket of heather flowers. Just a prune here. But Bruce is trying to revive the tradition of heather ale on a commercial scale, and he employs a gang of itinerant pickers to supply the sackfuls of heather he needs. Would you do it in a particularly limited location, or do you go all over for it? We have to go all over because of the way that it flowers. It starts down south in Ayrshire, in Kintyre, and it flowers like a rash up through Scotland. So you follow it round through the season? Yeah. but. The the bell heather, that's this big purple bloom, comes in first. And then the small lilac one, ling heather, comes in about six weeks later. So, is this uh, starting to do what it should? Yes. <clears throat> Remember the white fat we put on there, mm -hmm. it's now gone clear. And that tells us that, that the liquid's at the right temperature. Just taste to see if it's sweet. Mmm. Sweet and, and quite sort of beery, really. Right. It's on the way. The next stage is gleefully messy. The barley husk is removed by straining through a cotton cloth. The liquid is boiled up with the heather flowers and a few sprigs of bog myrtle. After simmering for one hour, it's strained again through more fresh heather. This being Scotland, we don't want to waste a drop. The natural fermentation is started with yeast from a final sprinkling of fresh heather flowers. Bruce is donating this particular brew to the gastro wagon cellar. But the deal is, I'll be paying for it with my labour later in the day. But first, an afternoon stroll. I'm on my way to investigate an old ruin and see if there are any edible legacies amongst the crumbling stones. This is the kind of treasure trove you can find in an old ruin. Sometimes the history of human habitation does the forager a bit of a favour. And these raspberries aren't exactly wild. I guess you could call them feral, but they're very sweet. But this, I imagine, or somewhere near here, was probably an old fruit garden. And so many. I feel I'm entitled to a bit of a plunder. Oh, look at 
look, here we have our new heather picker. After my raspberry jamboree, I'm reporting for heather picking duty. Hey, see you. What? <laughs> you get um, I thought maybe you could help me out. All I had was a Swiss Army knife and a little basket. I thought it was, might be inappropriate. Yeah. I thought you might laugh at me, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Please equip yeah. him up. <laughs> you can't put today with him. Oh, oh hey, Ian, 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 look at this. Oh, oh, Woods. Oh, oh, oh. oh. oh wait a minute. Hello, yeah, well, wait a minute. I couldn't pick his nose near the food. My cartwheels, I'll go over there. Yeah, cartwheels, What is your real name, anyhow? My real name? Uh -huh. It's Hugh McFernley McWhittingstall. Hi. And the rest. Oh. Whittington Dickstone. <laughs> Is that you? A distant relation. Ah. You're related to Dick Whittington. Right. He was the Kiss Me Hardy fellow. No, no, that was Nelson. Oh, yeah. God, that English history is so tricky, isn't it? Scottish history is simple, though, isn't it? You spent the whole time beating up the English. No, 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 we just sing about it. We won once and we wrote a million songs, we That's won right. ten times and wrote one song. <laughs> <laughs> Which song was that? Oh, you, you won't know it, the English came and gave us a trouncing. <laughs> we don't sing it. <laughs> we don't sing it very often. <laughs> it's not written down in front of that one. Huh. Okay, is this your, your bag here? That's one of my bags, oh, yeah. Right. Uh, well, I think everybody else has met their quota. Yep. Want to just load up and head off? Go to it. Okay. Do you want anything at last orders then, Hugh? <laughs> Time yeah. you're finished. I have a pint of your finest heather ale, please. <laughs> that's, that's just the answer I was looking for, you. Yeah. All right then. If there's any left. Mm. If there's any left by the time you get... In fact, that we passed licensing hours. Save me a thimbleful. Yeah. Bruce and I had agreed a price of two sacks of heather for my beer. This turned out to be not quite the bargain I'd originally thought and it wasn't until rather late in the day that I caught up with the rest of the crew. Westminster! Midges! And Hugh Whit Whitfernley Whittingstall. My own! Whittingless, Whittington, <laughs> uh, I'm dead. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>